we are putting on a conference called Evolution Exposed. We pulled in experts on the subject of evolution for a total of 11 speakers and gave them just 15 minutes to give us their best. And on top of all that, a one hour Q&A panel session. You're going to love Evolution Exposed. Anyone can refute evolution. Due to the zoo, to me and you. All that a fairy tale. Not allowed to ask questions. It made evolution look ridiculous. That was the foolishness of atheism. I yeah. knew I was going to get corrected. No, I wasn't even listening to your answer. Uh, <laughs> fairy tale. This guy might be coming for you. Welcome to Apologia, and another installment of Evolution Exposed, Exposed. Our claim-by-claim -claim investigation of the Creation All-Star Mega Seminar. If you'd like to catch the series from the beginning, tap on the playlist above my head. Next up in the cavalcade of speakers was Ken Ham, the president of Answers in Genesis, whom you may know from, well, a huge portion of the videos on my channel. Normally, this is a place where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians, but sometimes it's better to bring in a current Christian. Hi, Ken. Uh, well, I'm here at the Ark Encounter, and you can see the Ark Encounter behind me, actually, the life-size Ark. Hey, did you notice on this screen, it's Kernham? I did notice the Kernham. The seminar was put on by Ray Comfort, so it's hard to tell if the typo was incompetence or if it was just part of their ongoing practical joke feud. And of course, we have the other attraction, the Creation Museum, the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world. These are the two largest Christian entertainment sites in the world. I'm like, oh. I, I never viewed Christianity as an entertainment site to begin with. But uh, <laughs> one of the reasons we built these and we have the Ministry of Answers in Genesis is to really be a ministry to the church as well as to the culture. The way he presents the Answers in Genesis is very telling. You know, even though they say they're about science and about biblical authority, what it really comes down to is they're fighting the culture war and those things are really the predominant thing they're focused on, so, you know, social issues. The problem I find with Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis is that they seem to think that if we can just convince people that Genesis 1 through 11 is scientifically and historically accurate, then all these social issues will just be answered. Right. And you're like, that's not the case. <laughs> you know, different people and even different Christians have different views on these various social issues. But like my view of, let's say, what the proper approach of abortion would be mm -hmm. has nothing to do with Genesis one through 11. It has to do with, you know, a whole variety of other factors that you have right. to, as a conscious adult trying to think through difficult issues. you have to get to a good idea? It's not just like the Bible says in this verse, boom. It's <laughs> right. like a lot of it is kind of a very childish approach to culture, to science and to the Bible, quite frankly. But yeah, those are the issues that I think are, primary for answers in Genesis when it really gets down to it. And they're not trying to convince anyone new. No, no. I'm sure on some specific social issues, I probably agree on certain points. I don't want to come across as, oh, he's just right wing Republican, all it's bad. That's too simplistic too. The problem I have with answers in Genesis is that it wrongly equates Christianity with a certain political party. Mm, for sure. And again, People do that on the other side, and I don't like that either. It's really tempting to fall into that trap, and I think we should fight against doing that. Right. Ken didn't invent this. He's just no, kind of along for the ride. He's part of the larger culture doing it, ironically. Mm. <laughs> in America, you notice something. 56% of the greatest generation before 1928, they were born, went to church. Then we go down. Silent generation, 44%. Boomers, 32%. Generation X, 27%. Millennials, 18%. There's an exodus from the church. You have to recognize the church is not impacting the culture as it once did. And then when you get to Generation Z, and that's a younger generation, as George Varner said, the first truly post-Christian generation, twice as likely to be atheist as any previous generation. Statistically, it's true. More people are leaving the church since 1950, you know? And so he's pointing to an actual true trend, but Ken Ham and Answers to Genesis tend to kind of assume that the high church attendance of 1950s America was the way it always has been in 2000 years of church history. And when you look at the broader picture of church history, what happened in the 50s and early 60s, really, there was a whole bunch of other factors that led to it. You know, we were just coming out of World War II, and there was obvious evil of Nazism in World War II and the Soviet Union. A lot of young soldiers went over there, fought, dealt 
came back with a lot of trauma. A lot of people were looking for meaning in life and they turned to God and Billy Graham was doing his thing. And it was a simple message. A lot of people changed. But also, let's face it, after World War II, the big enemy was Soviet Russia, which was communist and atheist and yep. executing Orthodox Christians left and right. And so for better or for worse in America in the 50s, Christianity was kind of a patriotic thing. You were patriot and a Christian together. It was a way you showed your patriotism. We're Christian, they're atheist. And that's when we put in God, we trust on our money. When we inserted one nation under God in the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance, of Allegiance. Yep. it was a way to say, we're not like that. But that's not the way it was throughout most of church history. We have this stereotype that in the medieval time, all of Europe was Christian. And I mean, yes, it had Christianity had an impact on Europe in a lot of ways, but for the everyday plebeians throughout Europe, they were still kind of pagan. They didn't go to church that much. It never was the way we tend to think it is. Just having a token prayer at the beginning of a school day in a public school doesn't really do anything, but Ken Ham thinks that's the key to making the culture Christian. And that's not necessarily the case. It's a very oversimplistic, naive view. It's becoming less Christian, or I should say probably less Christianized, because there's never been any true Christian culture, but less Christianized every day. That's true of our whole Western world. And we see moral relativism permeating the culture. As we look at those issues, whether it's the gender issues, abortion issue, gay marriage issue, racism, euthanasia, pedophilia, actually, they're not the problems in our culture. They're all the same one problem. Uh, they're, they're actually symptoms of one problem. As a Christian, I look at our America today and I think it's going in directions on a lot of the issues that aren't necessarily good. But Pan Ham is going to bring it around to the reason why it's happening. We're not teaching Genesis 1 through 11 is history. He gives that simplistic answer and he doesn't take the time to tease out and think about the complexities of this issue. I know we don't want to get into all the social issues, but let's just take one example, given what I know a little bit about in church history. Take the abortion issue. Okay. Now, the Bible itself, Old and New Testament, doesn't address it, really. It just doesn't. But when you read a lot of early church documents from the first couple centuries, they Church fathers say abortion is bad. It's killing. It's just like infanticide. But at the same time, you have to understand in the context of the Roman culture, there was a thing called the exposure of infants, where if a father didn't want a child, if the mother gave birth to a girl, for example, because they were more of a drag on the family's finances, they would literally throw the newborn infants out in the trash. I mean, it was really brutal. And therefore, a father could force the woman to have an abortion against her will because he was in charge. And so the early Christians, because they valued life and they really believed every single person was made in the image of God, they thought that that was wrong. And they would go out and pick up the children who had been discarded and raise them as their own. So it was a legitimately pro-life view. That being said, back then, you know, they didn't have the scientific knowledge we have now. Back then in the ancient world, both in Greece, Rome, and Christians were part of that. They had no concept of like a sperm and an egg coming together. You know, they didn't know that stuff. They thought that it was like when a man or woman had sex, that a man who kind of injected a really microscopic person into the woman. And she was literally just like an oven and that that microscopic person grew up and then eventually was born. So in their mind, it was a person from the very first moment. And so that leads to the question, knowing what we know now, if we're going to truly wrestle with that issue, when does that life become what we would consider to be a person? At the point of conception, it is human life. As far as life goes, it is life and it is human. But it's like 10 minutes after conception, is that two cells? Is that a person? You know, Ken Ham says, yep, as soon as conception, it's a constitutionally protected person. And if you don't believe that, you're going against Genesis 1 through 11. And it's such an oversimplistic view. It doesn't do anybody justice. I mean, the early Christians weren't trying to get the emperor to outlaw abortion. No. <laughs> they're going to do what they're going to do. As far as we're concerned, this is what we hold dear. You know, and I think that is a more intelligent, more thoughtful way to approach a social issue like that. And you can go through all of those. But Ken Ham doesn't want to do that. I think the social issues is really his main focus and the Genesis stuff and the science stuff are just tools he is using to fight that. And I think that's, that's not a good way to do it.
And that creates a lot of problems. And that's why he creates a lot of division, <laughs> to be quite honest. <laughs> when people say to me, what has happened to our culture? You raise up godless generations. You raise up generations. Even most of those who went to church, that went to public schools, you throw God out, the Bible out, prayer out, teach them. They're just animals. Teach them. Everything arose by natural processes. There's no God. Teach them, really, the religion of atheism. We're going to see generations doing whatever they want in their own eyes. This is another problem that Answers in Genesis has. They equate the scientific theory of evolution with atheism. Like it's the one and the same. That's a wrong connection to make. Evolution is a scientific theory that tries to explain how living organisms have evolved in nature. It doesn't say anything about God. It doesn't deny it, God. It doesn't say there's a God. It just, it's looking at how things work. Okay. That's the scientific theory. Atheism is a philosophical worldview. They're not the same thing, but Ken Ham seems to think they are. I like to affirm to people all the time that if you look purely by numbers, most people who accept evolution are Christians. Yeah. Yeah. I think even Darwin himself, who you know eventually became an agnostic, but he was like, there's nothing necessarily atheistic about evolution. Right. And a lot of early Christians who embraced it said the same thing. As I wrote in my book, The Heresy of Ham, let's say you buy a bike, but it's all in parts and you have to put it together, like from Schwinn. Evolution is kind of like the directions to put it together right? The directions aren't telling you where the parts ultimately came from or who the bike company is. It's just, you put this here and you put this here and this is how it goes together. To say that if you read the directions alone, then the directions are denying that there is a, such a thing as a Schwinn bike company. It's like, well, no, it, that's just, that's a different issue. It's just talking about the directions. And that's the way I see the theory of evolution. It's just talking about the natural processes that we observe. And you know, because Adam seen and we're all descendants of Adam. And so we're all sinners. That's our sin nature. Our nature is we don't want to believe God's word and we want to be our own God and decide right and wrong for ourselves, which is what you see with these basically godless generations in our culture. Okay. As a Christian, I would say to a certain extent, that's true. Genesis three is about human beings not obeying God and doing their own thing and bringing death and destruction upon themselves. That tells us something about who human beings are. We're sinful. We disobey. And we screw up. But the problem that Ken Ham, he's tying the veracity of that view, that human being sin, he's trying to tie that to something that isn't true, namely the earth is 6,000 years old. And that's the answer to everything. Again, when you read a lot of his stuff or watch a lot of his stuff, on a surface level, there's some truth to it. But his problem is that he tries to tie the answer to those problems to a literal scientific reading of Genesis 1 through 11. And that not only is scientifically not true, I would argue when you look in church history and good biblical exegesis, because that's kind of what I do, that's a wrong interpretation of Genesis 1 to 11 to begin with. So it's kind of ironic that the foundation he's tying it to is not exegetically true. It's not true in church history the way he presents it, and it's not scientifically true. Does the average Christian in our churches really understand what that means to start from God's word? You see, if the Bible is what it claims to be, and it is, it is the word of one who knows everything there is to know about everything, who's always been there, who knows everything, has revealed to us all we need to know to enable us to have the foundation to come to the right conclusion about everything, to have the right worldview, the right set of glasses on. And you know, when you start with, from God's word, you build a Christian worldview. When you start from man's word, you build a whole different worldview, a secular worldview. From a Christian perspective, there's ultimately, you know, to, not to say Led Zeppelin is a Christian perspective. Yes! There's two roads you can go by, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is ultimately following Christ and not. But again, Ham has chosen to reduce it to this oversimplistic dichotomy and basing it on a faulty understanding of Genesis 1 through 11. So when he says the average Christian doesn't really understand what it means to start from God's word, again, to a certain extent, he's true. A lot of people who've grown up in the church really don't know their Bible that well as much as they think they do. They know the Sunday school stories on a very superficial level, but when it gets to really understanding them on a deeper level, Ken Ham's right. Most people are pretty ignorant. The ironic thing is, so is he. I would argue the reason why Answers in Genesis has gotten somewhat of a foothold in the evangelical world is sadly because a lot of people are more or less fairly biblically illiterate 
And when you are that way, somebody comes along with a very easy to understand answer. Oh, okay. That makes sense to me. You know, I don't want to say it in a sinister way. It's not like he was preying upon people's illiteracy, but he was, (laughs) you know, I think he truly believes what he's saying. He truly believes a very simplistic understanding of the Bible and he's pushing it. And the very fact that he's somewhat successful at it, it's confirming, oh, God must be blessing me because I'm doing the right thing. I came to my conclusions about Genesis 1 through 11 not being historical a good 10 years before I ever looked into the creation evolution debate. If you would have asked me in 1997, my view of Genesis 1 through 11, I would have said it's an example of ancient Near Eastern mythological literature as a genre, and you have to explain what that is. But I think it is inspired to speak the truth about the basic fundamental Jewish worldview regarding God, humanity, and nature. But it's mythological in its genre. But if you would have asked me, oh, so do you believe in evolution? In 1997, I would have said, well, no, that's atheism, because I didn't know anything about it yet. But the point is, you can get to a proper understanding of what Genesis 1 through 11 is without any references to science or evolution or anything. If you just dedicate yourself to understanding that so certain chapters in their historical and literary context, you know, good biblical exegesis, you can come to that conclusion and it has nothing to do with science. But for Ken Ham and a lot of young earth creationists, they think it's a science issue all the time and they can't get out of that little gerbil wheel of logic. We have whole generations of kids that grew up in the church and 90% of them or more went to public schools that were taught the foundation man determines truth. Uh, God was thrown, thrown out the Bible, creation, prayer. They were taught evolution as fact. They come to most of our churches, sadly, not all, but the majority of them have said, you can believe in evolution millions of years. That doesn't matter. Look, as long as you trust Jesus. Here he's going back to the, the, the core problem is public schools aren't praying and evolution is atheism. But what makes me cringe when he says something like that is they're just telling people to trust Jesus. Like, yeah, that's kind of the point. But for him, the real foundation, he uses that word, is understanding Genesis 1 through 11 is historically accurate. That's the real foundation. And if you're saying Christ is not the foundation of the Christian faith, but a historical reading of Genesis 1 through 11 is, you're not preaching Christianity. That, well, to use the title of my book, that's heresy. Okay. And he's just talking about man deciding truth. Like you're creating that ideology, and that's theological idolatry in my book. It's not the Christian faith when you put that much emphasis on it. Now, to be clear, I know a lot of Christians who, well, they don't believe evolution, they believe the earth is young, but they realize that's not the foundation of their faith. That's an issue like we might have a difference of opinion about politics or whether or not you should sprinkle or immerse in baptism. Most Christians have different opinions, but they know it's a secondary issue and that's okay. The scary thing with Answers in Genesis and Ken Ham and Young Earth Creation as as a whole is even though they say they are not doing it, what they really are doing is making that one issue of whether or not you think Genesis 1 through 11 is historical and scientifically accurate. That's the foundation of the gospel. It's like, no, it isn't. Just flat out. No, there's no sense in arguing that because it's just not true. And so we're trying to teach them Christian doctrines, trying to put the Christian worldview on top of the wrong foundation, and it won't work. Because if we haven't given them the foundation of God's word and starting with Genesis 1 to 11, which is a history that's foundational to our whole worldview, what happens is when they have that wrong foundation, eventually they'll build a secular worldview. He says, you know, you can't build a Christian worldview on the wrong foundation. And I would say, yes, that's true and you're building it on a wrong foundation. The foundation of the Christian worldview is not it. Genesis 1 through 11 has to be historical. And again, like I say in my book, you can go through church history. You will never find that has been a tenet of the Christian faith. It's not in the creeds. Yes, you can find certain early Christian theologians and fathers have different opinions on how to interpret certain passages in Genesis 1 through 11. But at no point did the church ever say, Young earth creationism is a fundamental foundational tenet of the Christian faith. It's just not there. And Ken Ham says that over and over again. Sorry, that's not reality. They went toward apologetics. You see, 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to make a defense or answer. And the word uh, translated defense or answer is the Greek word apologia, from which we get our word apologetic. And where I got the name of this channel. 
people ask the same basic questions. Well, don't we live in a scientific age? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? Have you know the Bible's true? What evidence <laughs> is there for God? Who made God? Well, we're not going to, we, we won't answer all of them. Let's not. But if you notice, he's talking about teaching apologetics, teaching the true biblical answers about Christianity. And then you look at all the questions he throws up. Hasn't science disproved the, the Bible? No, move on. Because the right. Bible isn't doing modern science. What, okay, what's the, how do you know the Bible is true? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I think a lot of the Bible is historically, but other parts aren't meant to be understood historically. And that's where you have to become biblically competent. But again, you look at all these questions. It all has to do with Genesis 1 through 11. For him, that's what Christianity is about. And that is just really sad. That's all he ever focuses on. Dinosaurs didn't live millions of years ago. Hasn't science uh, actually proved that evolution is true? It shows that the lens through which he is reading Genesis 1 through 11 is what I call a very modern scientific, I would say, you know, enlightenment worldview lens. He reads Genesis 1 through 11, and the first thing he does is ask scientific questions. A good Bible teacher would tell you when you read an ancient text, the first thing you need to do is try to understand it from their point of view understand the original context, putting the questions of authorship of the Torah aside. Well, just, mm -hmm. you know, traditionally speaking, when God inspired Moses to write Genesis one, what do you think the original Israelites were thinking when they encountered Genesis one? I can guarantee you they weren't thinking, wow, this refutes Darwinism. The first thought you would have is, whoa, there's one God. That's where they were. They weren't asking scientific questions. They were living in a pagan polytheistic culture. And Genesis 1 teaches that there's one God, that nature has order and is good. <sighs> Mind blown for that. That human beings, they're made in that one good God's image. You mean human beings have dignity and worth? Because if you learn anything about the ancient Near Eastern mythology, one of the things taught in that mythology is that human beings were worthless. You know, they're nothing. When you see it through that lens, Genesis 1 through 11 says some amazingly foundational theological truths. It's not doing science, but right. because Ken Ham is such a slave to the Enlightenment modern scientific worldview, beyond quite honest, he even reads the Bible through that lens and he doesn't think that, oh, maybe I'm the problem. And you see, here's the reason why it's important in 2 Corinthians 11:3. Paul has a warning for us that the devil is going to use the same method on us as he did on Eve to get us to a position of not believing the things of God. And what was the method he used on Eve? To doubt God's word. Did God really say? Here's the interesting thing with 2 Corinthians. When Paul writes that, he doesn't want the Corinthians to be led astray with the certain pagan practices of their time. He wants them to lead a godly, Christ-like life. He's not talking about you need to read Genesis 1 through 11 scientifically. Ken Ham is taking this verse out of context just because it says Eve. Therefore, it must be about the scientific reading of Genesis 1 through 11. It's like the original context of 2 Corinthians is not that. But again, it's a simplistic presentation that is not biblically literate. That's my big concern with Ken Ham more than anything, his bad reading of the Bible. Right. You can obviously compare real situations to literary situations. Yeah, for sure. Answers in Genesis, one of their main arguments is like, well, in the New Testament, they affirm the historicity of Adam and Eve. Like what? This verse. Right. Okay, Paul mentions Eve. He's mentioning Eve in the story to make a theological point. He's not saying anything about whether or not he believes Eve is historical or not. You cannot derive that he's affirming the historicity from that verse. Because certain New Testament writers make reference to things in Genesis 1 through 11, therefore, it must be historical or you're calling God a liar. That's a big jump. We need to be teaching generations to be thinking foundationally. What do I mean by that? Well, how do you build a house? Well, if you like Ray Comfort, Ray Comfort's not a carpenter, he's not a builder. So the way he would build a house, he would start with the roof and then he would try to build the walls and then try to put the foundation under it. Okay. I had to have a little go at Ray Comfort. Uh, he's a great friend of mine. He and I have fun insulting each other being, you know, from down under area. Don't go into comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not that funny. You see, at the Creation Museum, we walk people through 
the Bible. I mean, it's all the seven seas of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion. That's the geological, biological, astronomical, anthropological history that's foundational to the rest of the Bible. I've always loved this one. If you just look at that, okay, this is how they teach the Bible, the seven seas of history. What's missing? Pretty much everything in the Old Testament outside of Genesis 1 through 11. I mean, four of the seven is Genesis 1 through 11, and then they skip to Christ and the cross. Okay, that's Gospels, and then Revelation. So in their presentation of the Bible, they make the 11 chapters in Genesis that I would argue aren't history. That's what they really focus on as history. Mm -hmm. And then they skip the actual history of the Old Testament. Literally, the word covenant starts with C. You could stick it right in there, but see <laughs> yeah. confusion in Christ. I know. That's a good point. But yeah, the sheer insane irony here is he harps on the Bible's a history book, but then he leaves out the rest of the Old Testament. Like that's the part of the Old Testament that is historical and you're not covering it. And then, I mean, even with the New Testament, yes, Christ and the cross, that's the gospels. Let's skip the early church and Paul and Acts. That's history. And so- the seven seas of history, four of the seven aren't history, and he's actually skipping over the actual history in the Old Testament. That's not the way you teach the Bible. And again, I, my PhD is in the Old Testament. Like, I'm all about Old Testament history. I teach a class on Old Testament history, mm -hmm. and you've completely ignored all of it. It's so comically infuriating. My undergraduate degree was in British literature, okay? Mm -hmm. When I went to the Creation Museum, have you been to the Creation Museum? I have. Yeah, I have. You walk in, it's dinosaurs everywhere right from yep. the beginning. And I, I came up to one of them. It was a little display with Beowulf and how he talks about Grendel and a dragon. And you know, many people think that Beowulf is historical. I'm like, nobody believes that. <laughs> that one really got to me because I love English literature. And it's no, Beowulf is not historical. One of the ironies in AIG is harping so much on actual history. And then so much of the time, they're literally making things up. I mean, even the Ark Encounter, if you look at closely, a lot of their little plaques by all their stuff on the Ark is like, Noah could have gone right. to shipbuilding school. He might have. So basically, everything in here is speculation and made up. Much of the church has given up those first four C's and said, it doesn't matter. In fact, the church in a sense has erased history. Talk about people erasing history. <laughs> you just did that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, Ken. Talk about people erasing history, like the entire Old Testament outside of Genesis 1 through 11. In regard to the abortion issue, uh, one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that we've raised up generations starting from God's word. When you start from God's word, man is made in God's image. Apes aren't made in God's image. No animal is. Ken Ham says, you know, man is made in God's image. Apes aren't made in God's image. Okay, well, what do you mean by God's image? What do you mean by that? Most people leave it undefined. And it's just kind of, you know, whatever. And then something, well, it means that, you know, human beings have language, intellectual ability. And again, all that's true. But again, in the ancient world, if you use the word image, what would you think it is? You're going to think, oh, an image, that's an idol. Yeah. In the ancient world, an image was an idol that human beings built that then bowed down to worship. You know, kings made images of themselves. Kings had images, the plebeians didn't because they're worthless, right? And so one of the theological things emphasized in the Old Testament, in ancient Hebrew religion and the later Christianity, is don't worship the pagan idols because you're making those images and that's, well, stupid to worship things that you make, right? Instead, and here's the line, God tells us, you are made in my image. I made you you're my little idols, so to speak, representations in the world. It's saying mankind has dignity and worth because we're made by the true God, made to represent his goodness in the world. That's what it means. It has nothing to do with biology or you know, our mental capacity. So yeah, apes aren't made in God's image, but it's not for the reasons Ken Ham thinks, you know. But again, the image of God is a fundamental theological concept laid out in Genesis 1 that really is important to the rest of the Bible and to Christianity, and Ken Ham does. But what he thinks, it's, it's foundational history. Like, no, it's foundational theology, the theological lens through which to interpret history. It's not history itself.
So God put Adam to sleep, made a woman from his side. He said, the woman came from the man, bone of my bone. Then it says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they'll become one flesh. In other words, God invented marriage, not the Supreme Court justices. To a certain extent, yeah, that's true. Tinham puts that forth like, therefore, man and woman marriage. And again, as far as church history is concerned, that's what they put forth. But biblically, if you look throughout the Old Testament, well, Abraham had many wives. Marriage has not always been solely a man and solely a woman. Ken Ham's presentation is just overly simplistic because throughout the Old Testament, there was polygamy. And I'm pretty sure Ken Ham would say polygamy is wrong. And okay, when you look at early Christianity, one of the reasons why women were attracted to early Christianity in the first few centuries is because Christians said that men should only be married to one woman and they should support them and love them, which is very unlike the pagan <laughs> practices, right? You know, in the, in the Roman world, you could you have your wife and then you'd go down to the local pagan temple and have mm-hmm. sex with prostitutes. And so from a Christian perspective that we would call the traditional marriage of one man, one woman, that has been promoted, yes, but it doesn't come just from that verse. And when you get to the modern issue of gay marriage and stuff, that's a whole nother thing to wrestle with. And people can have different opinions and, and whatnot on that. But you can't throw a single Bible verse in Genesis 2 and say, oh, there you go. There's the answer. Mm. It's not doing justice to people who are really trying to think about this. Even if you disagree with a certain view, the way Ken Ham approaches it is not loving or constructive, quite frankly. When Jesus is asked about marriage, Uh, He says, haven't you read? Read what? Read the word of God? Read the writings of Moses? In other words, we would say read Genesis, where God made male and female, Genesis 127, and therefore shall many men of his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they'll be one flesh. In other words, man, uh, woman came from man, man came from dust, woman didn't come from an ape, woman, man didn't come from an ape, man, but that history in Genesis is the foundation for marriage. Note what Ken Han said after that quote from Jesus. Oh, therefore, man came from dust, women came from man, they ain't ain't an ape. I'm sorry, just as factually speaking, I don't think Jesus said any of that stuff. I mean, again, Ken Ham, I don't think you think he realizes how much he's reading into the text, his own biases. And it's not just marriage. Ultimately, every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. That part is kind of true, I would argue. Theologically, there's a lot of stuff in Genesis 1 through 11. That doesn't mean it's history. To this day, the majority of our Christian leaders say you can believe in millions of years. But the Bible says death came after sin. You see, after God made everything, he said everything he made was very good. So if you have all this death and disease in the fossil record before sin, then God calls all that very good. This gets back to the fundamental issue, how you interpret Genesis 1 through 11 as a whole. Ken Ham obviously is arguing that it's historical. So when he reads Genesis 1 through 11, in this case, Genesis 3, it's something that literally happened back then about 6,000 years ago. And because Adam and Eve ate a piece of fruit from a tree they shouldn't have picked from. That's why we have tsunamis and cancer and arthritis and death comes from that. So death is only about 6,000 years old. And that's what he argues. But what helped me to understand Genesis 1 through 11 is instead of viewing it as chronological history, the way Ken Ham does, because when you do that, then you are faced with all these problems with the fossil record and all this stuff. But imagine a shoebox. Like, you know, when you're in grade school, you meet those dioramas sometimes. Ah, uh, diorama rama, my favorite school event. You know, a shoebox with little figurines in the middle. Prepackaged Star Wars characters still in their display box? Are those the limited edition action figures? What's a diorama? I view the Bible and the biblical presentation of histories kind of like that. The actual figurines in the shoebox. That's biblical history. That's when you get, you know, I would argue Abraham, Exodus, David, Old Testament history, Jesus, the early church, all of human history is in the shoebox. Okay. But then picture both ends of having like a curtain. And on this curtain over here at the beginning, so to speak, is highly symbolical pictures Adam and Eve, the flood, Babel. That isn't the history. That is the backdrop against which history is interpreted. There's a God, human beings are made in his image, but guess what? Human beings screw up and we sin and die, okay? That's the point. He's not trying to pinpoint a time in history 
when it started. Okay. And so therefore the other end would be like revelation. Right. Again, you don't read that history. Literally it's ultimately, there's going to be a new heaven, new earth, but it all comes down to how you understand Genesis one through 11. It's therefore, it's not saying death came in because this historical guy sinned to begin with. It's just that this is what human beings are. I always find it interesting. The whole notion of the, what he pushes concerning sin, you know, Adam and Eve were perfect and then they sin. And because they sin, that's why you're a sinner. That encourages kind of what I call the second sin in Genesis three. The first sin is eating the fruit. What's the second sin? Adam, what did you do? Oh, it's her fault. So I think that's what people tend to do when they read it historically. It's like the reason why I'm a sinner is because some dude back then sinned. It's like when you're passing the buck, you're a sinner because you sin. That's it. Well, where did it come from? The Bible doesn't really tell us. That's just the reality. We're made in God's image, but we sin and we die. That's the curtain against which we understand history. But if you believe in millions of years and have taught kids that, then, then God's an ogre and he's responsible for death and suffering. And then there was bloodshed and death and suffering here for millions of years. And what does that make of the restoration of things one day? You know, are we going to be restored to a time when there's death, bloodshed, suffering just like today? It doesn't make sense. What he just is saying here goes along with, I think, a wrong view that answers in Genesis have. When God created Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They had a perfect genome. They we throw that into Genesis. And therefore, once they sinned, the genome started to break down. But early on, that's why Cain can marry his sister because things weren't screwed up enough. All that stuff they throw into Genesis, which isn't there. They're the ones reading into Genesis all this modern scientific stuff. What Genesis 1 through 3 is really about is God created things that weren't perfect so that Christ, who is the eternal second part of the Trinity, the Son, will have something to sanctify and redeem and to make better and to transform into something better. And that's what Paul talks about in the famous Roman 5 passage that answers in Genesis like to talk. He mentions Adam, it must be historical. That's not the point. Paul's point is that human beings in our natural state, the way we are now, we're not a finished product. So salvation isn't getting us back to that original perfection of Eden. We're going to something better. <laughs> And so to quickly tie it up and finish, you start with two foundations, God's word, man's word. You have two totally different worldviews. On God's word, one race, marriage, a man, a woman, gender, two, abortion, killing a human being. Man's word, races, marriage, you redefine, gender, you redefine, abortion, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare cats. You know, what's the difference for all animals? But now we've raised up generations without that foundation of God's word, and we're seeing the collapse of Christian morality. That's what's happened uh, to this culture. He talks about because of we fail to take Genesis 1 through 11 as history. That's a, leading to a collapse of Christian morality. If you know anything about the Bible, it's there's always sin in the world. No matter what generation, what time period you live in, there's always going to be bad, immoral things that people have to deal with. Human beings are made in God's image. They are unique and they have worth, but we're always screwing up. And the, we're always bringing about death in some way and then the, the good news that Christianity brings is that in Christ, you can overcome that. But if you see things in such an enlightenment modern way, and you read that into Genesis, and you insist it must be chronological and historical and scientific, you just, you come up with some really laughable answers, but you're so serious about it that you divide people and you hurt people by condemning them. They recently called BioLogos the house of heresy. I was called by my young earth creationist headmaster. I spoke with the voice of the serpent. You hurt people with this stuff. I'm teaching an early church history cl class right now. When you look at a lot of the early church fathers, the primary thing they harp on, not Genesis 1 through 11, it's don't hurt other Christians. Don't divide the church. When you do that, you make the church look horrible. And sadly, Answers in Genesis, so militant about it and so self-righteous about it, it has brought a lot of hurt to a lot of people. And that's too bad. So how do you combat it? Well, you speak the truth. <laughs> you try to set things clear. But that's all you can do, I think. Well, thanks for helping us try to set things clear with Ken. Dr. Joel has a YouTube channel where he's chronicled his visits to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And he has a blog called Resurrecting Orthodoxy. And of course, he has a book called The Heresy of Ham what every evangelical needs to know about the creation-evolution controversy. 
Links to all in the description and tell them Paul Gia sent you. Yeah, thank you very much. Next on Evolution Exposed Exposed, we'll cycle back to one of Ken's worst social takes. For instance, let's take the gender issue. Tap on the thumbnail on screen now and I'll see you over there. Later.